Welcome everyone to Tuesday's Timely Torah Talks. Tonight we have a very, very special guest, a very dear friend of ours, all the way from the Holy Land, from Eretz Yisrael. We have Rabbi Avi Slansky Shlita, a renowned speaker, author, Mechaber Sparm. Actually got a few copies today. Really excited about it. Rabbi Slansky, welcome. Shalom Aleichem. How are you doing? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's what a, a privilege to be here in the famous Chazak headquarters. It's our honor to have the rabbi, and we're really excited about tonight's topic, which is the world of halakha, of, of Jewish law. But before we delve into tonight's uh, exciting topic, rabbi, could you please give our listeners a little bit of background of yourself? I know it's not so comfortable to talk about yourself, but a little bit about uh, where you've learned, what, uh, what you're involved with, etc. For sure. Well, first of all, as you'll all hear, I will have a hard time doing the halakha, I am not Sephardi by nature, and therefore I'm going to have to go the regular Ashkenazi route. It's all after right? But uh, we will try our best. I live, Baruch Hashem, I live in Eretz Yisrael, living there now for about nine years. And as uh, we got a free promo a moment ago, we've written uh, three Sfarim. I say we because they're written based on uh, the famous Shirim of uh, Roshagi Kalis. And uh, Merit Hashem, we're writing, we're learning, we're teaching. I'm a Rebbe in Yeshiva Merka Zatayra in uh, Yerushalayim. We give a Tafiyemi share, which uh, many people enjoy. And uh, it's an honor to sit here and talk a little bit about halacha. Oh, beautiful. Rabbi, I actually have a few chaver told me that uh, they started Tafiyemi and they listened to your share and they really enjoyed it. So, Yagda Torah Yadir. So, like was mentioned, this week's topic is the world of halacha. The word halacha, which we usually translate as law, uh, the root of it is, uh, is, is to, to go or to walk. Lelechet, holech, right? So some might feel that the halacha is a bunch of restrictions. How do we view halacha as a way towards the best life? We know halacha is following the, the Torah's laws, and Torah is Torah, which is the way of life. Rabbi, if you could give us shed some light on this topic. So I think a story that they say with the Chavetz Chaim, and stories with the Chavetz Chaim usually are true. Not always are they written down. But the story is told that Rosh Hashiva met the Chavetz Chaim. And said to the Chavetz Chaim, you know, you have a, such a fabulous Sefer, Shemir Zalashen. It's not for me. I can't learn it. The Chavetz Chaim obviously was probably not devastated because he was the biggest Anav on two feet. But he said, what's your problem? And the Rashiva says, I need to be able to talk. I'm going to learn a Sefer, Shemir Zalashen. I'm going to have to keep my mouth shut. That's not me. I know Shtika, silence is the best. But I have to talk. So the Sefer looks beautiful. I bought a copy. Don't worry. But it's not for me. And the Chavetz Chaim looked at him and said the exact opposite. Without the Sefer, you can't talk. With the Sefer, now is when you could open your mouth. And this is really the beautiful description of halacha in the right terms. Is that it's not necessarily a straitjacket, it's not necessarily restrictions, which hopefully we'll talk more about today. But it's, it's a way of life. And it's a way of life that the more you know, the easier it is as this is hopefully something that we'll talk a little bit about in the next few minutes, but people all the time remark, you know, we, I teach Allah in yeshiva, and as after many of the shirim, the boys say, wow, I, I never knew that. And I say, oh, so what do you think about it? And expecting them to be, oh, I, I can't do this, and I can't do that. And they explain to me, it's great. I didn't know that was allowed. I didn't know I could do that. And I didn't know... Like, it's just such a small difference. Let me, let me do it that way. And that's really the world of halacha, the proper world of halacha, which is what the Chavetz Chaim was teaching us. And similarly, to give one more uh, example, is the Shem Shem Pinkis famously, I think it's actually one of his farim, when he talks about Shabbos, he says, Muksa is an example of what Shabbos is. Because on Shabbos, your hands are different Shabbos. They're Shabbos hands. Why? Because on Shabbos, you can't just do whatever you want. You can't just pick up a pen. You can't just move things around. You have to know, is it muksa? Is it not muksa? So people hear this story and they feel constricted. What? The whole Shabbos? I have to think. What? And, and for, for some, when they're at the beginning stages of learning, it is difficult. But as you learn more and you start to realize, first of all, it becomes part of your nature, which is the beauty of it. But more than that is you start to learn, it's true. So I couldn't move it in that way. But in that way, it's perfectly mutter. And we could give so many examples, which I think we're going to get to later. 
but let's just use the pen on the table. Could you move a pen? A pen is muksa, so you can't move a pen. So someone's going to say, oh, it's so difficult, I have to come here and bend down, put my mouth in his pen, and then he's gonna, people are going to start yelling at me about corona, they're going to start burning the pen, and what am I going to do? But then you realize, no, what's the halacha? is that if the pen is on the table and you need the place of the table, you could pick it up and move it. I could pick it up with my hands. Yeah, you could pick it up with your hands and move it and sit down and have your Shabbos suda. So halacha, like the Rav said, is to go. It's a way of life. It's a way of knowing what Hashem wants you to do. And then everything changes. And as we'll see more, hopefully by the end of today's show, how it's really going to be in people's favor. And hopefully we'll get to there soon. Amazing, amazing, Rabbi. Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Rabbi Slansky, unbelievable. Very, very big kids of, uh, you know, in Alakha, there is sometimes a difference of opinion. There's Rabbi A says this, Rabbi B says this, and Rabbi C says that. Uh, can you please give, explain the importance of having a personal rabbi to ask your questions to? We know in Perkei Avot, in the Ethics of Our Fathers, it says, Make for yourself a rabbi, so you don't have any spekod, any doubts. Rabbi, if you can give us, shed some light on that topic as well. So, the question could be a dangerous one, and we're going to try to tread water tightly on this one. I say l'cha rav, like the rav said, and that's, that's the answer. And actually, as I was driving over and I knew I was going to have to talk about halacha, I put a phone call into one of the machabrim, one of the writers of Dirshu. Dirshu Mishnabura, I'm Zeicha, I learned with him, Bechavrus, his name is Rabbi Yaman Hollander. He's one of their writers of the Dirshu Mishnabura, which by now is more than a staple, more than a staple. And I, I asked him, I asked him some of these questions. I asked him, what would you say about halacha? And he said, you know what the real, real difficult problem is? Is that, what do I do? Rabbi A says mutter, Rabbi C says usr, everything's mutter, everything's usr, and, and everyone is just, and this was without me prompting him the question. He said, that's, that's the biggest difficulty. I said, so what should someone do about it? So his answer, and maybe we'll just elaborate a little bit, was you got to find the middle road. As the Rambam, Maimonides famously coins it, the Shevil Azahav, the middle road. Now that doesn't mean that one should on his own flip a coin, ah, mutter, usr, so today it's mutter, tomorrow it's usr, the next day it's forget about it. No, it means there's a, there is a middle road in life. But how do I know that middle road? I don't know. What do I know? I know a few words that I read in this book and I saw on this email and I saw on this year. So that is where a rav comes in. And we'll give the Pashib shot now, and later we'll give a very unique shot I was told this morning. Is that you make yourself a Rav, and you don't have Svekas. Why not? Because he'll just tell you what to do. It's very simple. It's very simple. But what if he tells me it's us, sir? What if he tells... So every Rav, obviously, knows his constituents and knows how to deal with it and he knows who's willing and who, not willing, who is holding at a place to be machmir, to be stringent, to be mekel, to be lenient. And the Rav is the one with his das, with his seichel, with his wisdom, could make that very, that tightrope is really the tightrope of life. And that's really the job of a Rav. And more so, and uh, I think the question was a personal rabbi. And personal is, is, is so critical and crucial. Because, as we mentioned a few moments ago, your entire life is halacha. Everything is halacha. Problem is, not everything are you willing to discuss with some big, long, bearded creature who you don't want to get within four feet of him for many reasons. So if that's who you view as your rav, it might be time to find a new rav. But your rav has to be a person who you could talk to, who you could approach. And there's no better honor and joy that a rabbi has when uh, someone will come over to him and ask him a personal question. How do I deal with this? What should I do? What does halacha say about this? Should, do I have to be machmer? Can I be mekel? What, what should I do about this story? And very often, a lot of questions which we might think are, are not halacha, very often they boil down to halacha. But the most important thing is to have that rav that you respect. The rav, as we all know, is like a demos of a malach, is like a shem, is like someone who is transmitting the word of God. That doesn't mean that he's not allowed to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes in this world. We all know that. What that means is we're willing to accept what he's going to tell us. And we're willing to follow what he's going to tell us. And But most important is to be personal, to be able to discuss and talk to him. And I have seen myself in the short amount of time I said I teach halacha to the, to the boys in yeshiva. You see, over the year, the beginning of the year, the questions are one type. You know, what do I do that I 
You know, what bracha do I make? You know, all the holy questions. And uh, do I need to? X. And by the end of the year, you're starting to really get into things. You know, do I need to do this? And I forgot this. And I woke up late. And, you know, I, I, I feel bad. Don't feel bad. You made mistakes. What do you do about it? And then you start to really get to know people. And with being, having a personal rav, that's where you could grow. And that's where everyone could grow together. And that's really the greatest way of to be mistalik menasafik is to have that rav who's going to guide you and be that light for you along the way. Amazing, Rabbi. Unbelievable. Love the chizit, the inspiration. Very important for everyone to take it upon themselves to make sure you have your Rav. Like the Rabbi said so beautifully, make sure that you connect with him, make sure that you feel uh, connected with him and it has time for you, etc. Rabbi, in your experience, what do you say is the most common misconception of an activity which is permitted but people think isn't and vice versa? That's a loaded question. Yeah. That's a loaded question. <laughs> and I, I, I can't say the most common because, you know, everything is in common. Opinion, but I'm, I'm just going to give a few examples. I put together okay. a few examples. This is, you know, this is uh, actually a favorite of mine. Usually at the beginning of the year, we, we throw out a few cases and like to hear everyone thinks everything is mutter and everything is usher and everything is the opposite. So just, just a few... A few simple cases, we'll start with one which is dear to me based on the first book that we wrote, Wine, Whiskey and Halacha, is that a bottle of wine, a bottle of wine and I'll tell a, I'll tell a personal story. And my L'chaim, when I got engaged, engagement party, so a bottle of wine was opened and a nice bottle of wine and my future father-in-law hands me the bottle of wine and says, be careful with it, don't put it down, They're, the waiters are not Jewish. I said, sure. So I took it, you know, a few people had some drinks. I didn't put it down, but my future brother-in-law asked me for the bottle. So, maybe I was naive. I thought he was included in the, don't put it down. I gave it to him. I'm going to get in trouble for this one. I gave it to him, and he took a drink, and what did he do? He put it down. Within a few seconds, what's happening? The waitress comes over, picks up the bottle, and is moving it over. How future mother-in-law, eagle eye vision, comes flying in from the kitchen, makes the dye for the bottle, and without anyone saying anything, she's on the way to the kitchen with the bottle. And there was someone there. At the time, I myself didn't know what to say, and I wouldn't have said anything anyways in that situation. Someone was there and said, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. What do you mean it's okay? She's not Jewish. No, no, it's okay. What do you mean it's okay? She's not Jewish. She picked up the bottle, and she's walking with it. So the reason why... Now we'll just fast forward to what's the first and most basic premise of all of Yain Nesech, of non-Jews touching wine, is what's the whole reason it is forbidden for non-Jew to touch wine, to move wine? It's because they might pour it to Avodazar and they might pour it to an idol. Says the Gemara, if you have a cork in a bottle, can you pour wine to Avodazar if there's cork in a bottle? It's not possible because there's a cork in the bottle. It's not possible to pour it that way. And therefore, says the Shulchan Aruch, says all the Paiskim, and if there is a cork in the bottle, now what does it mean cork in the bottle? It does not mean it was never opened. It does not mean it's hermetically sealed. It means there's a cover on the bottle. Rav Yashiv said, even if there's a piece of aluminum foil in the bottle, it's not the way to serve a Vaidazar that way. So she could pick up that bottle, walk all the way to the kitchen. You saw her the whole time. Obviously, if you didn't see her, it could be different. But you see her the whole time. That is 100% permitted. And it might even be baltashchis to throw it out. Because there's, there's nothing, I, I say might even be, because there are some opinions based on Kabbalah that are machmir and everything, but in the basic realm of halacha, that is perfectly fine. And that's something that happens all the time. Now, I will give a big disclaimer. It's better often, especially in this regard, to be stringent because it is difficult. That's why we wrote a whole book about it. It is difficult and there are nuances and it is a wonderful idea to tell the non-Jews, tell the cleaning help, don't touch the wine. Rabbi, don't touch it. You know, this morning I was in a bris, oh. in a brit, and we had this whole shadow. Oh. There was a certain reason. It's beautiful. <laughs> so it happens all the time and you show the cautious agencies. I one time got into a little bit of a quabble with a certain mashkiach because someone came over to me and asked me what's the status of the wine. I told him it's fine because the cork was in it. And he came over to me. So what are you doing? Our policies. I said, that's a beautiful, you're right. It should be the policy. You should not let the guy touch it and you have to make a big deal and you have to yell at her, not in front of everyone else. You still have to have manners, but you have to make sure. And that is, that's just one uh, simple example. We'll give another example. Um, we'll give uh, a Shabbos example. Bayer. Bayer. Separating on Shabbos. One of those things that until you learn about it, it, like, it doesn't bother me, no harm, no done. You know there's like this interesting 
problem on Shabbos to sift, maybe. And we're like, yeah, we don't have a sifter, and leave me alone. But then we start hearing, no, any form of separation could be a problem of separating on Shabbos. So the simplest example is you're sitting there on your plate, and you have a piece of meat, Kovach Shabbos Kodesh, honor of Shabbos, you have a piece of meat with a little bit of fat on it. So what do you do on a regular Tuesday? You slice off the fat, you move it to the side, you pick up the piece of meat and you enjoy it. Add a little salt perhaps, a drop of garlic, okay, to everyone their own taste. But you move away the fat, that's the normal way. On Shabbos to do that, I think according to everyone, would be 100% forbidden. And not only also Bayer is unique, an Iser de Oraisa, Iser Minat Torah, biblically forbidden, times of Chazal, we take you up to the three-story cliff, throw you off the top, take some rocks, throw on top of you, you're still moving, throw some more rocks, we, we take care of you. Okay, oh, it's only if there's warning and hasra, and it doesn't happen very often, but okay. Just to point out, it's quite, uh, quite severe. So, what do you do? It's so simple. Are you allowed to cut? You're allowed to cut. Cutting wasn't a problem. After you cut that fat, what do you do now? This is a visual. We'll, we'll move to the camera. Here's our piece of meat, and here's the fat. So to cut it, I didn't do anything. It's the separating. So if I go like this, and I push up like that, it's a zareza. If I take my fork in the left hand, proper etiquette, and because the right hand has the knife, not usually, and I pick up the piece of meat, mutter gummer. Because that's called oichel min something easy, something permitted, something edible from something non, from the bad, the good from the bad in English. So when I, the simplest of actions, now that's an action, I'm hoping some people are hearing and saying, wow, that was so simple. And it is so simple. And once you learn it, and once you do it two times, now you know how to eat a piece of meat on Shabbos. Was that difficult? Was that constricting? Did that make your life so problematic? Absolutely not. So, you know, in yeshiva, we call it almost, part of my language, a stupid sin. Why do it? Why? There's, there's other things you could be busy with. Why? Why push away the fat? Just pick up. Just pick up the meat. Should we give one more example? Yeah, please. Very, give, very good. Give one more example. One more example. Uh, I don't want to go controversial, but uh, it's not that I'm arguing, but let's... let's this is a Mishabura that talks having a cup of coffee before davening. Mm. One of the uh, more you know, famous Sharetzians, Mishnaburas, because the Mishnabura says, no sugar and milk. No sugar and milk. And many, a student, many from Jew, learns this Mishnabura and says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. No sugar, no milk. And usually what happens is, no coffee from the evening. Because many people, again, I'll be honest, without the sugar, it's not a coffee. Without the milk, it's for sure not a coffee. <laughs> Yeah, I had one rabbi that yelled at me, he called said, that's the men drink it without sugar and milk. I said, okay, so I'm not a man, what do you want from me? But the bottom line is, I need my cup of coffee. And that's what you would think when you read the text. And is that correct? It's the text of the Mishnaburah, what could be more correct? But the problem is, when you look at the example, and he says, the Mishnaburah explains, why is it also based on the Gemara and Brachas? It's because it's gaiva. It's haughty. What are you busy drinking something before you serve your Creator? which is very clear, says, if not all the pais game, and I don't say if not because this goes over time, is that nowadays, if to you, a coffee without sugar and milk is not a coffee. And I say to you because in Eretz Yisrael, not to make this uh, have to do with countries, but there's a guy who sits in front of me every day and he sits there and has his black coffee, no sugar, no milk, and it's normal. And the smell of it makes me want to gag, but, it, but he drinks it without a problem. Okay, so, but for many of us Americans, without the sugar and milk, it's not a coffee. So is it gaiva? Is it haughty? Of course not. Of course not. Now maybe if you start going and putting in your frothed milk and your caramel and your, uh, all the other different things, you know, maybe then. But again, just, just simple examples that, is it us or is it mutter? We have to just know what is the proper thing to do. Is it a misconception? Maybe, maybe, and there's many, many more. There's many more we could talk for the next, I don't know how many hours, but I think we have to move on. Unbelievable, Rabbi. Very, very great examples, uh, uh, and, and it inspires one to continue looking and studying and delving into the realm of halacha, and that leads me to my next question. There are thousands of pages of halacha. Uh, there's many, many safari, many books. What practical steps can we take to access the world of halacha as a gradual process? So it's great that you say gradual, because that is <laughs> the key to everything in life, because if it's not gradual, within... I'll say a day to be nice, but with shorter than that, it's, it's all out the window. Right. So the, now the answer, fought, I don't know how many years Torah anytime has been around, but I think now it's... About 15. Now 15, but I think in the last five, it's been more of a... Sure. So let's go five. You know, six years ago, the answer might have been, go find the safer, go find the book. But now I, I think the answer probably is there is so much out there. 
so much out there. Anyone who's watching this, wherever you found it, whether it's on YouTube or anytime, podcast, wherever you found it, there's so much halacha there also. Oh, yeah. So much. Good stuff, easy stuff, simple stuff, pictures, graphics for every, every geographic, every dynamic, easy, intermediate, difficult. So find a shear and listen. But how am I going to learn from a shear? Why not? Listen and listen and every day, gradual. It could be one year, it could be half a year, it could be every other day, it could be once a week. But of course, it doesn't, let's just be careful, it doesn't do away with the Rav. You still need to have a Rav and to not have a Rav. And I'd like to add on one dot to what I said before. I heard from Rav Yasef Elephant in Eretz Yisrael, a tremendous, tremendous everything. I don't want to give him a title because that's going to diminish. So I'll tell you a tremendous person. And he was talking about this detail about having a Rav. And he said, why do you need to have a Rav in your life? So everyone says, to ask them Allah That's what we're talking about tonight. He says, it's all true. But you know why you need to have a Rav? So that your family has a rabbinic source they look up to. So that there is someone greater than what goes on in the mundane life. And he is that source of transmission from the Torah of the Moshe Misenai. And when you have a Rav, the entire dynamic changes. It's true, the Shailas are important, of course. The Shirim are important. Learning from them is important. But you need to have a Rav just to have the Rav. Just have the dynamic in your family so that your children know when there's a question, it's not, ah, so is this allowed? It's not allowed. Uh, yesterday was mutter. Today it's, okay, no, let's flip a coin. No, let's quickly, uh, let's do a quick Google search. I see this someone here says mutter. I don't know. Okay, someone says, ah, sir. Okay, we can do it. No, so the children see that there's, there's a rabbinic source and everything comes from such a source is just uh, so incredibly important. Unbelievable, Rabbi Slansky. Uh, you know, we'll end off with this. You know, this program is called Tuesday's Timely Torah Talks. Rabbi, can you please leave us with some closing inspiring remarks for our listeners, uh, you know, which is especially timely. You know, your final message to our broad audience. Okay, timely <laughs> sounds a little bit scary, but just... Again, I, I don't want to say disclaimer. Some people probably heard, you know, certain things they thought were us or were mutter, and now they're thinking, great, so I'm going to go find everything is mutter. Yeah, he mentioned about having a rav, but nah, okay, you know, we'll send him shalach manas, <laughs> and um, everything's going to be fine. But the truth is, it it's goes so much deeper than that. And that's really the theme, and I'd like just to talk about it for one moment, is that that Mishnah of Asei Lecha Rav. So the, the simple explanation is Asei Lecha Rav. Make yourself a Rebbe. But I saw so a friend of mine told me today, there's a Medrash Shmuel that says a little bit deeper. He says, Asei lecha rav. Make yourself into a Rebbe. Make yourself into a Rav. Then list Alek Menasafik. When you know what to do, there is no greater simcha. And I subsequently found that in the very, very Chash of Sefer Piskei Chuvis, he quotes the final Ramah, the entire Arachayim. And the Ramah says over there, he ends with cryptic words, V'toiv leiv mishtetamid. And the good heart feasts always. Interesting words, and he, he elaborates, and it's not the time, but he basically points out, based on a Pasuk in Mishle, that when you don't know what to do, it's a terrible place to be. Terrible place to be. And that is, he based on the Pasuk, Kol yimei ani ra'im, that the days of my ani, I'm poor, it's terrible, I don't know what to do. And we can make it simpler on the words of, that in simcha, katar sasvekas. What brings one joy? Clarity. Clarity in all areas of life. And halacha is one of those areas. So to bring it into life is incredibly important. But once it's in our lives, not to be fumbling and not to not know what to do. Because you don't know what to do, then everything just becomes, again, it's all mutter, it's all asr, it's all I don't know. And, and it just, and then, you know, I'll be honest, usually what happens, everything becomes mutter. And then you always have that like nagging issue. And then it comes, you know, a tish above and a yim kippur and you tell God, oh, you know, I'm going to be a little bit better. And then, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. When you have the Rav and you have someone to teach you, or Rav, you make yourself the Rebbe, you listen to Ashir, you read a good book, you have questions, you ask questions. Then you start to realize, why do things that are Usr? Why? That case of the meat, I think, is such a simple example. And there's, we could talk forever about these examples. And that's usually what we try to do is just give, you know, everyone says, taking child on Friday night is so difficult. There's so many rules. It's a five conditions of returning. And, this. and then, like, after you realize, it's like, Ah, so I just take the challen and just don't, just like keep my hand on it, says Ramesha Feinstein. Serve the challen and put it back in and just make sure it was cooked and make sure the thing was covered and that's it. Ah, once you learn how to do something, it, it's really not so difficult. 
And it's more important just to realize that when you make yourself into that rav, it's the stalagman itself again, it's a totally different life. And, and with this I'll conclude, why is it a totally different life? Especially now, you said timely, we're in the three weeks, we're moving towards Tisha B'Av, and we know many reasons for the Chorban. But to give a generic reason is because Hashem is not in our life enough. He's not there. We lost him. He lost his house. We lost the temple. He's not in our life enough. And how do we bring God into our life? It's a very difficult thing because, what do you mean? I say Baruch Hashem a thousand times today. I say thank you Hashem. I got the stickers. I send the emojis. I do everything. What do you mean he's not in my life? The answer sometimes is he's in your life when he's there and then as soon as you don't want him there, he goes into that little box, you put him away. If your life is a life of Allah, if you realize that everything goes with Allah and you realize, okay, I have to ask questions, I have to learn, all of a sudden, God becomes part of your life. You're going on a vacation. That's a question. Is there a minion? Does there have to be a minion? Maybe there doesn't have to be a minion. I didn't just give an answer. Maybe there doesn't have to be a minion. Do, how far do I have to travel? I'm stopping at the rest stop now. It's before Shkia. Should I daven be a chida? Should I not? All of a sudden, Hashem is automatically part of your life. I mean, I allowed to buy that cup of coffee at Starbucks. Could I not buy it? Maybe I could. There's so many different areas that as you bring halacha into your life, Hashem automatically, it's almost like some people saying, well, I don't want him there, keep him out. <laughs> automatically, he comes somewhat part of your life. And the more he becomes part of your life, hopefully, will be another way to merit that he'll finally have his house back. Amen, with the building of Mashiach, with all this wonderful terror that we're spending together. Thank you so much for having me. Rabbi Slansky, wow, what chizik, what energy. We really, really enjoyed today's program. It was really inspiring. You really brought a lot of clarity on this topic. And we want to remind everyone, every single Tuesday, special guest at Tuesday's Timely Torah Talks. And Rabbi Slansky, once again, thank you.